So you have an IRA or 401k or something like that, either one that you own or one that you inherited. And as such, you probably understand that at some point, the IRS is going to force you to start making withdrawals that they have to get paid after all. So the problem is that since December of 2019, things have just gotten a lot more complicated, and especially here in early 2022. So complicated, in fact, that it was recently revealed that one arm of the IRS thought one thing while another arm thought another. Now, that would be funny if it weren't that there were such big tax penalties involved. 50% penalties, in fact, for every dollar that you should have taken out in a certain year but didn't. So in order to help you with this, today we're going to walk through what's changed, who's affected, and what are some strategies that you could use to minimize the tax hit to both you and your loved ones. Stay tuned as we discuss all that and more right now on the Retirement Lifestyle Show. Welcome to the Retirement Lifestyle Show. I'm your co-host, Roshan Langani. Here I've got with me, we've got the gang all together again this week, Adrian Nicholson and Eric Olson. Gentlemen, how are you doing? I'm looking forward to this uh, topic we've got today. How's your, how's your week been? Week's Adrian? been good. How about you, Eric? Yeah, f- fantastic. As you've, my, our listeners have heard before, I'm a fan of the lowly Padres who have not been quite so lowly the last couple of seasons, and it looks like they're off to a good start. So it's, it's uh, very disorienting for Padres fans to have their team uh, actually with a winning record this, or this late in the season. Are you going to make it to a game this year? Oh, yeah. I'm heading back to see uh, both the Padres at Milwaukee and the Padres at the Cubs in late May and early June. How about you? Yeah, I'm trying to go to a Nationals game as soon as possible. Some of my friends have gone recently and they've had a great time. So I'm trying to make it out to at least one of those games sometime soon. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, the the both the o, the O's and the Nationals aren't looking really good uh, right now. But um, since um, I barely know baseball season has started because it's playoff time for basketball. So. <laughs> yeah, and hockey for the hockey fans out there. Yes, yeah. Playoffs I definitely get get more interested in across the board for all, all sports, but mm-hmm. I feel like I can only follow one of them uh, at a time with playoffs. I, and with hockey, I tend to get into it just based on how the uh, caps are doing. So uh, you know they are they are in the playoffs. They're up one nothing in their series. Hmm. So I'll I'll probably be watching game two. Great. Well, I should pay attention to that sometime this weekend. See a little bit of NBA action. Yeah, yeah. There there are some great games right now. It might might actually be the best part of the NBA playoffs. What's going on right now? Actually. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I just don't like how they tend to put like my favorite games super late at night. It's very inconvenient where I have to stay up till midnight just to watch some of the games I really want to watch. So, well, Adrian, that's a problem if you pick all West Coast teams. Yeah, I <laughs> noticed that honestly. So, I'll have to adjust my sleeping schedule just to uh, watch some games, but it's all good. Yeah, but guys, let's jump in our topic for today. Uh, I I think it's an exciting one it'll be complicated i'm hoping we can do a good job of explaining it to the listeners eric why don't you kick us off with the topic oh absolutely thanks so listeners today we're talking about uh something known as the required minimum distribution from your ira now if your eyes are just lighting up right now and you hear oh you hear those words uttered and suddenly it just sets you afire there's something wrong with you but it, nevertheless, all joking aside, this is an important topic because the what was once something very simple and that you could kind of have as sort of a back of the napkin uh, understanding is has now gotten increasingly complex since the passage of what is known as the Secure Act in December of 2019, and then with subsequent changes to the life expectancy tables that the uh, IRS has as uh, deemed as the ones to use for the calculations. And now even more, a, a notice released by the IRS in late February of 2022 saying, oh, some of you guys are doing it wrong. 
and now throwing a wrench into the understanding that everybody had been working from going as far back as 2020. So what we want to do today is to help you appreciate the complexity that now exists where it used to be simplicity. We don't expect you to memorize or, or, or retain all of these things, but just to be sensitized to the fact of this complexity. And then after that, then we'll talk about some specific things that are on the front burner right now and are still, they're still going through public comment and then there will be hearings and where even some of the rules around resolving some of the, the discrepancies or misunderstandings uh, some of those things are, are going to hopefully be resolved this summer. And if you are aware of these, you'll be in a better position to avoid missing on meeting the requirements of these required minimum distributions and hence the tax because the tax penalty is a doozy for messing up. It is if you fail to take out what you're supposed to once these RMDs kick in for you, whether that's on your own IRA or an IRA you've inherited, then you have a 50% penalty on the amount you failed to remove in the prior calendar year. So, it, so to, re, to remedy it, you have to actually not only take out what you didn't take out, but pay a 50% penalty on top of that. So we want to help you avoid doing that. And that's what today is about. In fact, I think if there are, you have an, a, an advisor or a CPA uh, who may not be completely schooled on this, you might want to just point them to this episode so that they have an opportunity to, to acquaint themselves in an uh, abbreviated fashion with some of the changes that have come and are coming so that they can provide you with better advice than they might otherwise do. Fellas? The only thing I'd add, Eric, is... Uh... I think this applies for savers as well as people who are in retirement. So if you're earlier in your career and you're saving right now, uh, as we discuss these these new rules, I think it actually makes the Roth IRA that much more valuable mm. with the new RMD rules. So if you uh, hear our introduction and you're not anywhere near your 70s, I would uh, encourage you to listen on and not move on to the next podcast. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And since you mentioned Roth con contributions, then we'll just throw in there Roth conversions, which we'll come back to in a big way. This makes potentially a stronger argument for Roth conversion. Yeah. And I think some of the big uh, areas you have to look at when it comes to your RMDs is first, just what age are you? Who your beneficiary are is a very important aspect of it. If you pass away, who's who is going to get your qualified accounts and the way they have to withdraw and the age they're at can really impact um, their overall tax bracket and just how much money they withdraw. So it can be very complex. So again, you have to know what age you're at and who your beneficiary is and your overall, how much you've saved in these qualified accounts to really narrow down to see how much you're gonna be withdrawing. And this is when the planning aspect really comes into play just so you can see what's the most efficient way to tackle your RMDs every year. Right. Well, if gentlemen, I think maybe it would be helpful for our listeners if I just walk through a little bit of what used to be the two main categories of beneficiaries and then how that's expanded. So our listeners have some sense of just how finely granulated these differentiations have, has become. Would that, is there something I can move on to that? Or or Jeff, something else? Great idea. Okay. So folks, once upon a time, it was pretty simple. You would say, I'm an owner. I have a required minimum distribution. And that would kick in when the year in which uh, you turned 70 and a half. Then you had, okay, what if I pass away and my spouse is my 100% beneficiary of my, of my IRA, which is common, a common sort of distribution strategy. Then the spouse could make it super simple and roll your IRA into his or her IRA and just go from there working from that spouse's, the surviving spouse's own life expectancy table. And then there was basically one other main category. It was non-spouse beneficiaries. And so in the, with the case of the non-spouse beneficiary, you would use the beneficiaries, the, the beneficiary's age 
at the time of receiving it, or if it was a group of beneficiaries, then the oldest recipient who was named in that list of beneficiaries, again, not spouses, and their, their life expectancy would be used as the new basis for distributions, and it would be whatever their life expectancy was in the year in, in which they inherited it, then each and every year thereafter, you would shorten that. The formula would, would use a shortened f- factor uh, where it's simply a, subtracting one. You don't need to remember that, but you just remember that there's the essentially these, there's you, your spouse, and other people. Not anymore. <laughs> so of course there's still you. And of course, there's uh, still your spouse, but now there's also with even within your spouse, there is. Did you pass away before you were required to start taking your minimum distributions, or did you do it after you were required to? Different outcomes there. If your spouse doesn't roll it into his or her own IRA, what about non-spouse beneficiaries? Oh boy, now there's a new category. <laughs> It's called the Eligible Designated Beneficiary, or EDB. I love these acronyms. The Eligible Designated Beneficiary is actually a a subset of people. Could be your spouse that falls into that. It could be your minor children. It could be somebody who has a chronically ill person or somebody with a disability. Uh, Or somebody who didn't fall into any of those categories, but was someone who was less than 10 years younger than you. Well, they have a certain set of rules. What, but if they're outside that group, then there's a different set of rules for them. And hold up, I mentioned your minor children. If your minor children uh, receive it, they have a formula that stays with the, the other members of that group that I just mentioned, the eligible designated beneficiaries. But when they turn 18, boom, they switch over to a different formula and have now 10 years in which to do it. It is a mess. And now, lest, lest I not cover the entire waterfront, there's an, even a category called no designated beneficiary or a non-designated beneficiary. What's that? That's possibly your estate. That's possibly uh, someone um, that is a trust, some of the trusts that you might mention. And there it uses a different formula. There are five-year rules. There's 10-year rules. There are life expectancy rules. Guys, it's a maze. So let me just pause right there, guys, and see uh, if your heads are swimming enough right now. That's why I like the Roth so much it, <laughs> when we talk about this, because uh, at least as of right now, it simplifies things, and it, uh, it's tax-free. So we're, when, you, when you take that out, when your heirs take it out, as well so it um makes the it it simplifies the problem now it's got to be worthwhile based on your tax bracket especially if we're talking about conversions but um and here's for the for the savers that are out there people that aren't retired that are listening i always say when you're saving towards retirement typically i like saving uh to your works retirement plan up to the match first because that's free money if you miss the match you missed out on free money Second, I like the Roth IRA. And then third, uh, you go back to the 401k or investment accounts, depending on what other goals goals you have. So besides free money, I think the Roth is the way to the, the way to go. And I think these RMD rules uh further underscore that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree, Roshan. And like I mentioned before, this is why it's so important to know who your beneficiary is and who are you passing these assets to because for, for an example, if you have so much saved up in these qualified accounts and then you pass it down to, let's just say, your child who has a very high income and they're forced to withdraw, you could be forcing them into a, a higher tax bracket. So this is where the planning aspect of it is very beneficial and also just contributing, if it works for you, contributing to a Roth or doing those conversions to just start converting and paying those taxes now. So you're not forcing anybody into a tougher, tougher situation. So the planning aspect is, I mean, we say this every episode, just very important here. And just like Eric said, it, it is a maze. And we're going to share a, uh, the table that we've been looking at as well in our show notes that can kind of break it down for you, depending on who your beneficiary are. And it shows just the different outcomes that will, uh, will come from it. So it's all really 
really great points that we're touching on right now. Any other areas we should cover? Eric, is there anything else that you want to touch on this subject? Yeah, I, I would also just highlight this, that <clears throat> we had talked about this one controversy that had come up, or controversy is perhaps a little bit too strong, but at least a, a stark misunderstanding. And I think maybe misunderstanding is being a little too charitable. I think it's a mix-up even inside the IRS with one group inside yeah. the IRS thinking that their own rules based on the law passed by the Congress, as I said, in December of 2019, that their own rules then should be expressed in one way, and then another group inside the IRS not communicating with them, thinking it should run a different way. And finally, that coming out as public knowledge at the end of February. So what is that difference? Well, the difference is this. We all had understood after that SECURE Act was passed that many people now would be moving to this schedule that was no longer related to their life expectancy, but instead was a very simple 10-year rule. So let's just use this as an example. Let's say Roshan passes away and um, he makes uh, me, because I'm just such a dandy guy, he gives me a 100% primary beneficiary. His wife and children are very upset, but nevertheless, I'm smiling because I appreciate Roshan's kindness toward me that way. I have now 10 years to take that $100,000 or whatever the number, we'll use $100,000 in this case, 10 years to take that out. I could take it out 10,000 at a time. I could take it out uh, 5,000, 5,000 some years and nothing others and then big chunks at other years. I could leave it all till the very last year. I could do anything I wanted with it. Simple. And then what that would allow me to do at least is to say, all right, I'm just going to look over the course of the next 10 years, try to forecast based on a combination of two things. Number one, my own expected income as, at the household level, both my wife and me, over those 10 years, and look for the, the low points. But I also want to match that up with what I think are the tax laws. And you, as you, our listeners, have heard us say many times, we have some low rates in place through the end of 2025. Then they kick back up to higher rates at the start of 2026. So if that holds, I got to map that in there too. But I'm going to find the place where I'm going to get hit with the fewest taxes. Well, what was released at the end of February of 2022 now says, oh, wait, there's a subset of you. You non-spouse beneficiaries who are not these eligible designated beneficiaries if the owner died after 2019 and, and was already receiving or had, had reached the point of their what's known as required beginning date, then, ha, ah, here's a wrinkle. You have to use, you the inheritor, have to use your own life expectancy and, that has, and you have to in years zero through, or one through nine, satisfy the at least that much as your own life expectancy table would require. You can do more, but you have to do at least that much. And then by year 10, it, uh, anything that hasn't come out must come out. Oh man. <laughs> now that what was seemingly simple or a simple system of the 10 year rule, not so simple anymore. Yeah, that, uh, that creates a planning challenge. Yeah. And there, just to, to, Re repeat that or go over that again prior to this information coming out so the, the this secure act was passed in 2019 right so at, at it goes into effect and people think all right i've got 10 years i don't have to take this money out then in 2022 uh the irs showing either confusion or not explaining things correctly however you want to look at it says hold on you can't wait till the end of year 10. You should have been taking money out already. Mm -hmm. So there is some clarification expected later, later this month. Uh, we're in May right now, May of 2022. But theoretically, people who did not take money out in 2021 could be subject to a penalty of 50%. Without having been told, or their attorneys didn't know, their advisors didn't know, they didn't know, it hadn't been published on that basis. I think it's, 
I, I don't know. How unreasonable do you think the IRS could be? I, it just seems to me, surely they would say, okay, we choked. We blew it. We're not going to make you pay penalties on that, but we do need you retroactively to take out that cash that you should have taken out in 2021. What do that you makes the most sense to me. Or, or start it going forward, do something. But they can't... Um, uh, I can't imagine them throwing what I'll call a hidden penalty uh, yeah. at people. Yeah, I know. By the way, listeners, if you're thinking, well, wait a second, my, you know, my, uh, the person from whom I inherited this IRA passed away prior to 2020. Okay, you're working with the old rules. So you can breathe easy. What we're talking about is... Uh, recipients of IRAs where the decedent passed in uh, 2020 or later. Yeah, and, and once again, before this information came out earlier this year, everyone thought you could just wait till, till the last year. As long as it was all out by year 10, you could take nothing out years one through nine and take it all out in year 10. Now it, it, it appears that that has changed where you have to take some money out in years one through nine, but it's the, the greater concern as well. Did you have to do that last year when you weren't told? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So guys, I gotta we, assume too that some people just waited just because they, I guess, depending on the situation, some people just want to invest it, try and grow it a little bit more other than just withdrawing right now or the opposite end. They just didn't want to get bumped up in their tax bracket or maximize it. So there was a, there might be a whole bunch of reasons why people waited too. So it's really interesting how the IRS will really respond to this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we were talking about planning implications. And th I think this is really where we want to help people. Listeners, you, you've, you understand, as we said at the beginning, there's a lot of complexity. We don't expect you to retain it all. Just understand that the world has changed. But let's talk about some of the ramifications then and some of the planning strategies that you might use around this. And some of the maybe the and and why some of those planning strategies are are relevant, Adrian. I know you you were talking about um, one kind of one two punch that's been created by a couple of the developments here in twenty twenty two. Why don't you talk about those? Well, the main thing is in general that RMD should be reduced because of the new IRS life expectancy table. The years are going to be going up, which will ultimately reduce some people's or most people's RMD for the year. So that's just one aspect you should just consider planning. If you're somebody that relies on your RMD to cover your monthly expenses, you may need to be taking out more than what you previously needed to do. And then the other aspect that we touched on too was just our Roth conversions, a good idea for you just to convert some of this, uh, this money that you have built up in these qualified plans so you have the ability to withdraw from them tax-free and you can overall manage your, your tax bracket, I think are the two really interesting points that you can plan and look at going forward. So let, let's take a simple scenario. You, you just gave one and we'll just, I'll, we'll actually, we'll just call that scenario one. Somebody is taking their RMDs because they need it. They, they, it's part of their spending plan, not because they're forced to, it's not excess. And so in their case, they may not be bothered by the life expectancy table now ex working from the assumption of longer life expectancies and hence lower withdrawal rates. They'll just ignore it. They'll take more than the, than the schedule requires because they need it, right? So that, in that sense, the life expectancy table change won't affect them. But, they're, but the, the, if they're operating under a 10-year rule, um, irrespective of whether or not they were doing this, how does the 10 year rule affect them? It affects them. Uh, just, are you referring to just withdrawing or? Yeah. So let's say they're them? taking out more than the RMD, but not necessarily enough to drain it inside of 10 years. So they're taking it out at a rate. So what, how, how would they work with this? What, what sort of planning approach would they use? Uh, saying, okay, I, I don't have to worry about life expectancy table assumptions, but I do now have a 10-year window. What should they be thinking about? Uh, it's well, they should planning. always get their, yeah, their tax bracket. They don't want to just withdraw a lot more if they're in a, a high income year right now. And then also just looking at if a Roth conversion would be beneficial in their plan. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, you've got to, well, you've got to look at uh, the way, the way I interpret that, Eric, or the, the approach I would take is, should you be increasing what you're taking out every single year? Uh, and that, the answer to me on that is looking at the tax bracket you're in now and where that will be by year, by year 10, if you delay it and you're taking a big chunk out then. There is the a- added complication, uh, which would encourage taking money out earlier. The added, the added part that uh, rates are supposed to go up after 2025, uh, as the um, uh, current rates uh, sunset. Mm-hmm. Right. So in that case, and Adrian mentioned potential um, uh, uh, conversion possibilities out there. Although I think you'd be taking money out of this account and converting another account if you had an IRA to just move money over. But either, either way, this to me is, is about tax planning and making sure in year 10 you don't take out so much money that you bump yourself up multiple brackets and now you're inheriting that much less because your tax bill is higher. And mm-hmm. another, I guess, point I want to make, I guess it's not a major one, but also just investing with the the markets right now maybe you just want to take out the specific amount that you're forced to take out so you can just grow the rest is that also just something that people should consider as well if you need that extra growth for your retirement i think it's something that people should also plan and look at as well getting right down to the penny yeah, I certainly agree with that. And as we've talked about in other ones of our other of our episodes dealing with uh, what we'll call asset location, here's how I've been thinking about this question. Let's say that I'm an investor that has money in four buckets. Bucket number one is my taxable account. Wait, I thought there was only three buckets. There are, well, in this case, I'm, I'm introducing a fourth. So in, in one case, I have money in my taxable account. In a second case, I have some of my money in a tax-free account, namely a Roth IRA. In the third case, I have some tax-deferred money in my own RI, uh, in my own IRA or 401k. And now in the fourth case, I have more tax-deferred income, but it's in an IRA that, I'm, uh, that I inherited so I, uh, it, we'll call that the beneficiary IRA. If I haven't reached my own required minimum date, I'm not forced to take money out of my own IRAs yet, but I am required to take money out of this beneficiary IRA. So what I would d- consider doing in this case is, since you cannot convert to a Roth RMD money, <laughs> And uh, so I would be doing this. I would be saying, looking really hard at converting my own IRA or portions of my own IRA into my Roth IRA. And along with that, I would be looking at the possibility of taking the entirety of my portfolio and allocating the slowest growing things that should be in my portfolio. I, my, if I'm, unless I'm a full pedal to the metal aggressive investor, I probably have some slower growing things in there. I'm going to probably put those slower growing things in my beneficiary IRA. Why? Mm -hmm. Because if I'm having to be forced to take that out during what might be for me, my peak earning years, I don't want that to be the fastest growing thing in my portfolio. I'd much rather have it be my Roth or even my, even my taxable account or even my own IRA more than that beneficiary IRA. Now you might Eric, think another, mm-hmm, another point ahead. on that actually though, uh, you're also being forced to take that money out now. So right. another reason That's... you want the slowest growing thing is if the markets decline, you don't have the ability to wait, right? You have to take money out now. Yes, that's right. That's a, if you're under that now, that new 10 year rule, that's right. So you, rule, yeah. as, and the principle there is, is that generally speaking, we like to see uh, people delay making withdrawals from accounts that have been subject to a decline mark related to the market. Yeah. And uh, Adrian, you mentioned how planning was so, uh, so important to this. And we talk about it, talk about it very often, but yeah, you know, I'll, I'll meet with clients who will say, uh, I'll meet with some clients who will say, I want to make sure I pass on as much as I can to my heirs. And that's a goal for them. I'll meet with other clients that say, 
uh, well, you know, I don't want to pay any extra in taxes or anything like that. If my heirs get less, so be it, right? They're, they're financially fine. They don't, they don't need the money. I just want to maximize my situation. The answer to each of those things will lead to different outcomes. If your goal is to make sure your heirs get more money, that would create an argument for Roth conversions, but you're paying extra taxes then. So if your goal is, I just don't want to pay any more than I have to, it would go against that. So you've really got to uh, think about what your own goals are to come up with the game plan that makes sense for you. Um, I have a question. I'm, not, I'm sure this will probably be hard to answer, but once you have a client situation, they come to you, this is very general, where they're like, I don't want to pay a lot of taxes in now. And the person I'm passing these assets to, I don't want them to pay a lot of taxes as well. It depends on where that person starts out. If that person walks in the door, they've got a million bucks in a in a uh, uh, very IRA. anti-tax there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you come in the office, you've got all your money. A million bucks is everything you have, and it's all in a traditional IRA. Too late for this conversation. Wow. Right. Because yeah. because they both can't. You can't have a scenario. Now you can try to minimize the taxes for both, but you kind of got to pick who's going to pay more uh pay the taxes you or your or your heirs if you're on the other hand coming in where you're at an earlier stage of your of your savings you're you're building your retirement as opposed to being at retirement well then how you save can can answer that question eric would you respond to that differently no i think that's right and actually i'm thinking about a situation that we had with one of my clients yesterday where we finally had built all of the data into the planning software and uh, it was the big reveal for this the this couple it was showing them wow based on the pension flows that you'll have based on the social security flows that you have and based on the fact that virtually every penny that you have is in a tax deferred account here's what your marginal income tax bracket looks like it's going to be until you hit the rmd stage and then once you do look out. And so at that point, we were sort of saying, okay, well, we'll, we'll think about the ramifications for your kids who in one case that I believe their, their outlook, this is, you know, looking down the road 30 years. So who knows, but their outlook is for one of the two children, lower likely likelihood is that that child will be in a lower tax bracket than they, the other child likely to be in a higher tax bracket than they, so that introduces some planning opportunities right there. But, the, but what it came back to in their case is we looked at, well, should we do some Roth conversions while the converting opportunity at these lower rates through 2025 is, is available to you? And do you know what? It showed like if, yes, if they would pound away between now and 2025, it would it would do wonders for what sorts of resources not only they but also their heirs would have as spendable resources later. So you know you guys you guys were championing the concept of a Roth IRA as a solution to this, whether you do it through contributions or through conversions. Uh, this was just proven out again yesterday as we went through the analysis for this client. Yeah, and Adrian, to your question, uh, what in this analysis, they're going to withdraw money earlier, so they're paying more in taxes, uh, and that, but that would lead to more money to their heirs, right? So your question of of um, of I was was I don't want to pay taxes, and I don't want my heirs to pay taxes. In in the example Eric gives, it's a great one for that because you have got to pick one, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. and in this case, they're picking conversions, which are at a lower uh, rate than it will be in a few years, but it's also paying taxes now before they would have to for the yeah, benefit of their heirs. That's, yeah. that's huge. That was a great example. Thanks for sharing that, Eric. Mm-hmm. Well, gentlemen, I'll mention one last wrinkle here, and, and but if you've got other things, uh, let's, uh, let's get those on the table. No, please continue. Yeah, so, I don't have anything else. You can go ahead, Eric. Uh, okay. All right. So listeners, just now, we, uh, a few episodes back, we talked about what is being nicknamed Secure Act 2.0. It's not actually called that, but it's just traveling under that name because in very um, tight, uh, in a very short time frame, 
relatively speaking, you know, most of the times the changes in the IRS RMD schedule and, and changes to the code concerning IRAs and 401ks and such isn't changing quite this rapidly. But we got a big change at the end of 2019, and now they're talking about another change just three years later. And that is that the House had passed this, this uh, bill, which if it proceeds on to the Senate is passed there and then reaches the president's desk and is signed by the president and it appears that's, there's a pretty solid likelihood that that could happen because it enjoyed tremendous bipartisan support in the House. If that happens, one of the provisions in that bill would delay these RMDs even further. So coming back to, and specifically, just as the SECURE Act went from 70.5 to 72, this would ratchet it up gradually over a 10-year period to 73, 74, and 75. So now come back to what Adrian said a lot earlier in this podcast, which was that, wow, if you have life expectancy tables that are, are reducing the amount that you're taking out because you don't need it, it's just surplus, and now you're given another opportunity to postpone starting to whittle down those IRAs because now instead of 70 and a half or 72, you're all the way out possibly at 75 before you're starting to make withdrawals. Your life expectancy probably didn't move out five years or four and a half years. But now, so you're now, you're probably leaving more, you know, all else being equal. That's an important caveat. All else being equal, you're probably leaving still more to your heirs. If it's your own spouse, that may not be a big problem. But if you're leaving it to a kid's, now you've left an even larger sum of uh, as yet untaxed money that they have to deal with in a short 10-year time frame in many cases. So now if they're in their peak earning years and they're layering even more income on top of their already peak earning, guess what tax rate might apply there? Well, it's an individual answer, but it's in in very likely going to be at least as high, if not higher, than in many cases, than the one that you were incurring. All the more reason, again, Roth IRA. I sound like a broken, we sound like a broken record, but it's just the obvious solution here, it seems to me. Yeah, I, I would agree completely on the same page with you there. It, it does seem like an obvious solution, and I keep going back to what Adrian said, it, it, planning it out. Like as we're discussing this, I'm thinking of a client, uh, in particular, who's got a lot of wealth, um, in their Roth in their, excuse me, traditional IRAs and 401ks and a majority of their, of their wealth there, a few million dollars. And, uh, it's going to go to, uh, to what the, um, uh, what's a non-spouse beneficiary. Um, uh, and so we know that there's going to be, we're going to be subject to the 10 year rules and taxes. And the, the conversation I'm going to have is very much what we discussed, Adrian, when you asked that question is who do you want to pay? Do you want to pay more in taxes yourself and pass on more to your heirs? Or do you want to pay less in taxes for yourself and have them get hit with a greater tax bill mm -hmm. and get less in money? And, and that's the decision. Uh, whatever the decision is, uh, is, is, is up to them. But that was not a conversation we really had to have before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess just looking at all the different options and laying out all the data is just the best thing you can do in the situation where you can just make the most informed decision where the longer you wait, it kind of narrows down your, your choices over time. So just getting started as soon as possible can really help out in the long run. That's for sure. So listeners, I personally want to leave you with this. Yeah, it's, possible that your advisor and more possible even probable that your cpa are, are are becoming acquainted with the fact of all this complexity but the fact is is that many still are not and so it, it, a prompt from you to be um to to encourage them to get acquainted with these rules will not only serve you well but you'll also probably be helping all of their other clients if you're, if you're on your own and you want to try to give this a shot, go right ahead. But if you're also looking for some help, we are here to help you. And part of what we do is in this process is look at just exactly the, the dynamics that we've already talked about. One is 
what over the next X number of years are likely to be your best opportunities for taking withdrawals from IRAs or 401ks. We also look at that in conjunction, as we said, with the tax rate. And we'll, we'll ask you about your heirs and what your expectations are about their, their particular tax rates approximately at about the time that your life expectancy wraps up. Because if, if legacy, if intergenerational tax, intergenerational tax minimization is one of your goals, then we want to help you fine tune your planning in, in uh, not only your own lifetime, but also in the lifetime of your children. Yeah, that is for sure. All right. Well, guys, anything else that you want to add? No, I, I like this topic. I think that uh, making people aware of it so they can start thinking about it and planning early can be very, very useful, very valuable, and prove to be a, um, a good move for them and their heirs as far as having more, more assets. Well, before you close this up, then let me just point to next week's episode too. So listeners, um, next week we're going to be interviewing an estate planning attorney who has, as part of his practice, a specialization in special needs planning. So if you have a child, a grandchild, a, a sibling, or some other loved one who's part of your, your web of relationships, and you see it as important to find a way to help that person have as much access to potentially state benefits, state-provided benefits as is possible, but at the same time, not leave them with only those state-provided benefits. And you want to do that in a way that best aligns with your own larger goals. Then listen in next time as we talk with this estate planning attorney for how to go about wisely doing special needs planning. Yeah, excellent. Uh, it, it does line, line up with this as well. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, additional information we get from that one. So yeah, that's looking forward to another great episode next week and to all of our listeners as we always say please like subscribe give us five stars reach out to us if you have questions or need help or episode suggestions we would really uh, love and appreciate that please check out the uh, website for uh, links for show notes for additional information about us that is retirementlifestyleshow.com And we will be back next week with another great episode. Thank you for listening.